here. Welcome to this latest edition of Keeping an Eye on the Geopolitical Ball, uh, my weekly talk uh, uh, here at Friends of Europe in Brussels uh, by my good self, Jamie Shea, Senior Fellow. Uh, this week, I want to focus on uh, information and cybersecurity. Uh, since the advent of COVID-19, we've all become used to working from home and becoming increasingly reliant, not just for our personal, but now our professional lives too, uh, on the internet uh, and on digital communications. This, of course, has been a haven for scammers and cyber criminals who have got lots more uh, data and vulnerabilities to exploit. Uh, and indeed, uh, there have been plenty of scams already regarding uh, uh, online sales of fake uh, vaccines or fake protective uh, clothing. But more importantly, uh, states have now entered the fray and we've seen a veritable information war uh, to dominate the narrative of how the virus originated and who has been handling the crisis best uh, between the United States, uh, Russia and China. This is what presidency of China has called discourse power and it's going to shape the battlefield of the 21st century, perhaps more than conventional tanks uh, and aircraft. The West traditionally has seen data as an asset of economic prosperity and to promote personal freedom. But for authoritarian countries, data is a threat, something to be managed and controlled within their uh, societies and manipulated and used aggressively uh, beyond their uh, uh, borders. And we've seen plenty of uh, instances of these state uh, information campaigns. Uh, China has been very aggressive in pushing back against US narratives. Uh, so as Russia uh, as well. Uh, and this it comes on top of several years in which the authoritarian countries have increasingly sought to produce their own uh, technologies. Russia, for example, FaceApp, a way of gathering uh, very good data recognition information exploited by uh, artificial intelligence, or China with TikTok, it's its own uh, YouTube-style platform, but with carefully filtered uh, algo uh, rhythms. Uh, in, indeed, uh, we also see these authoritarian countries increasingly selling this surveillance equipment uh, abroad. Uh, even the French city of Marseille uh, has recently contracted with the Chinese company uh, ZTE uh, to pr procure a mass surveillance uh, system. There's also evidence of China and Russia collaborating in the media space. Uh, for example, Russia's uh, RT uh, TV network has an agreement now uh, with Global Times uh, and the Xinhua uh, press agency uh, in China. And it's now evident in the parallel communications from Russia and China over Hong Kong that these uh, media collaborations are producing a common message. So we're dealing with great firewalls. Uh, we're dealing with a Russian law trying to disconnect uh, the internet uh, Russian internet from the global internet and increasing signs that other countries such as uh, Egypt, for example, or, or, or India, uh, or Iran uh, have uh, imposed internet shutdowns on their populations during times of crisis uh, and tension. Um, so as we come out of the crisis, we, are got, we have three massive uh, information problems that we need to deal with. First of all, the information itself and who monitors and controls the content. Secondly, the architecture of the global internet and whether it remains a single multi-stakeholder system or increasingly becomes balkanized into closed so-called sovereign uh, internets uh, that cannot be penetrated from the outside. And thirdly, the issues of governance. What kind of organization will establish the rules uh, and adjudicate uh, the uh, different uh, uh, information wars and conflicts? Uh, Europe is uh, not well placed. Uh, on the one hand, uh, it refuses the American model of leaving it to the private sector. But on the other hand, it also refuses the Chinese model of having this all top down and state controlled and state uh, driven. Uh, so where is Europe going to place itself in the search for a new global governance system on the internet? Will it side more with China or more will it side with the uh, United States? What uh, President Macron has called the uh, Californian uh, internet uh, model. Uh, this is an issue which is definitely going to have to be a priority for the new commission uh, once the crisis uh, is finally behind us. My second topic uh, today, and I'll develop this more net, 
ne next week uh, concerns supply chain resilience. Uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago at Friends of Europe, we held a security jam. Hopefully some of you may have uh, tuned in and participated. And uh, as we looked at the future of the EU and the experience of COVID-19, one of the key uh, things that came up was Europe's uh, vulnerability when it comes to supply chains. Take France, uh, for example, which ran out of basic things like swabs or paracetamol uh, uh, tablets uh, during the crisis. Uh, a country like France, which had big stockpiles of these things just a couple of years ago, had allowed all of that production to be outsourced to China and therefore suddenly experienced major shortages. Or Germany, which suddenly found uh, foreign uh, uh, countries uh, interested in taking over its pharmaceutical and vaccine production companies, such as uh, one uh, called uh, Curavac. So this has led, uh, as we come out of the crisis, to some soul searching here in Europe about is it necessary to break globalization and bring this production uh, back home in the way that we used to? Uh, can we afford it? Is it necessary? And what would be the consequences for world trade if we did precisely that? Again, this is a subject that I will return to in more depth uh, next week. But that's all for now. Thank you very much for watch watching uh, and uh, stay safe and stay well.